All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. So I'm going to continue a little bit of uh, Zach's presentation earlier to talk about NYC Mesh, but more from the social initiatives we've taken over the last year, um, especially for community engagement and volunteer involvement. Um, and so just to start off with like a little history of our organization. Um, it's been around since 2014, basically. And then uh, gradually we did increase uh, the number of nodes. Um, it's at least doubled every year. Um, 2017 is when Supernode 1 was built, uh, which was definitely a catalyst into the current uh, structure of our mesh. And uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, Supernode 3 became um, live. So uh, we have grown very fast, as uh, many of you already know. Um, We've had a 92% increase in the last year with uh, requests, and we've increased by 130% in the last year of installations. And a lot of this has been due to efforts in engaging the community more and turning us into a more of a community project rather than a um, cons consumer um, service, so something that people would passively consume. Uh, this is an image of our map. So these are all the active nodes right now. Um, the ones in blue, in light blue, are our hubs, which will actually send information. Um, and then the super nodes are the two dark blue ones. And then, so as you can see, they do cover just a small area of New York City. Um, mostly the East Village, which is the lower east side of Manhattan, the island of Manhattan, and then Brooklyn, which is another borough. Um, one of These are two of the five boroughs or sections of New York City. And these are this is an image of all the requests that we do have right now. So there's clearly a lot of interest um, from the greater city. And there are... These three areas, um, more on the outskirts, so Staten Island, Queens, and the Bronx aren't really uh, covered yet, or Upper Manhattan. So there's a lot of um, efforts and desire to really push in that direction of uh, being more representative throughout the entire geography of New York City. Uh, so over the last year, um, when I started volunteering with New York City Mesh a year ago. And uh, it was still very ad hoc. Uh, people would jump onto projects as needed. And uh, it was very decentralized, which was a really um, attractive feature, at least for me, for getting involved with the organization. Uh, however, as time has gone by, we've really, real and to manage the growing numbers and um, just the scale we have decided to incorporate as a 5013C, which is a nonprofit organization. Um, and that would allow us to have a um, get tax refund or uh, tax deductible donations, as well as be eligible for grants, um, have a bit more legal autonomy with projects. Uh, so currently, we, and up until now, we have been a project of ISOC New York. And so this means we are protected and under the umbrella of ISOC. Um, and while we've managed most of the things ourselves, it has been a little tricky um, as far as moving forward. Uh, here is a bit of the, OK, that was, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. What's the question? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. So right now there is nothing like that. 
So we just submitted our paperwork for the 5013C, so it's still in the process of being established. Um, but yeah, so legally, if anyone is to give us a donation or any contracts that we sign or leases, they are under ISOC New York, um, which has been kind of confusing for the greater population. Uh, if we're asking for donations and we're like, hey, we're NYC Mesh, and then they go, yeah, I'd love to give you a donation. Then we say, I actually write it to ISOC, and um, that has been... Uh, this is what you currently are, ISOC New York. Correct. It's, it's Yes, it's a local chapter of ISOC. So if I, I want to get into the, the network, do I have to become a member of ISOC? No, you do not, no. it's uh, We don't really have all that much involvement with ISOC. I mean, we do, but uh, we are quite autonomous, um, which is why we realized that making ourselves into our own organization was beneficial. Um, and I, I switched those two. Uh, so yeah, the current structure, pros and cons, this is just to give an understanding of where we're coming from right now. Um, so we haven't, we've been able to have this decentralized model because we've been under this project. We really haven't had to have much administration or much organization um, because we do have this fallback on ISOC New York. Um, however, we haven't, it's been difficult to move forward, as I just mentioned, um, as far as donations, signing contracts, um, leases, and so there was, there have been some opportunities to have uh, fiber leases and move forward with uh, even just rooftop leases, and we would like to actually uh, uh, create those contracts in order to better serve the population of members who are interested in joining NYC Mesh. Um, give me a moment to, and so this is our structure today as we are under ISOC, uh, and, and then the mesher people, the mesh is really outside of the organization. So there hasn't really been all that much transparency in decision-making, um, or, uh, just, a, power to make decisions even. So it's, uh, we have this organization that technically has, you know, holds the wallet and is, has their own board. Um, and we haven't been able to, that very, only really one mesh member um, is actively involved in. So it really hasn't been representative of our actual community. And our new structure would be that we'd be working with ISOC. They support us very much in breaking off with them. And we would have a board of directors with people actively engaged in the organization. And then also it would help us actually be maintaining Supernode 1 and 3 ourselves without going through an organization that, again, we're not that involved with. Uh, so there's been a lot of ish, uh, concerns with this transition. Um, I think it was one of those things that when we brought it to light, many people uh, didn't realize what our relationship with ISOC was in our community. And there's been, there was a lot of concerns of making that it wouldn't be, it, was, it would no longer be decentralized and that it would... Uh, become very hierarchical, very bureaucratic. And so we're taking a lot of steps in order to avoid that. Um, then, so, but really uh, the problem was that in a de the, it's a balance in working in a decentralized organization um, to not have one rogue person maybe make decisions, um, you know, having a bit a bit more structure does help with transparency because now we have to record decisions, we have to record meetings, we have to make uh, our overall uh, community engagement a lot more transparent as well as our expenses. Um, and as we're also would be missing out on long-term contracts, grants for underserved areas, um, really full autonomy and a connection to a real organization. And I actually might skip that. Uh, so this is more what I've been working on over the last year as well, is building an organization of volunteers. I'm not, I don't come from a technical background. I work in education. And uh, 
So I became interested in NYC Mesh a year ago, but wanted to use some of my skills to help the organization, um, which did seem to be lacking a bit. Uh, so we do have a pretty robust group of volunteers. We have about 50 regular volunteers um, in the organization. It's entirely volunteer-based. We don't give anyone a salary. Um, the most we give is some compensation for installations that an installation leader would do, which is just $50 um, as a way to you know, compensate for the amount of time that it takes to put together an installation, get to it, lead it. Um, but overall, it is really volunteer-based. Um, and so these are a few uh, of the ways that we've had a lot of success with our uh, with recruiting volunteers and really making this a community project. Um, so first is events. We have a really active meetup group um, in which we host two monthly events that are standing monthly events and then also other events as needed. Um, they're free and open to the public. They're just posted on meetup. We get a lot of people who are interested in tech coming to our events and uh, it might just be their first time. They might have heard about it from a friend. Um, and the two monthly events we have are a monthly happy hour, which is the only event that was in place when I started um, participating in NYC Mesh, and then also an org meeting that I helped organize uh, last November, which is kind of a bit less of a social event and more of a way to get people immediately engaged. So we have working groups at these meetings to get volunteers engaged who also might ha not have a technical background um, and can help with similar skills that, such as I did myself. Um, so we have a, a marketing and outreach group who's worked on the website as well as flyers and development. Um, and other outreach materials. Um, and we encourage people to come each week or each month and present and really have an active role in this community, um, whether or not they have been working with us for very long. Um, so here's kind of a, some photos from our org meetings. Um, we host it at a donated space that one of our members uh, works at each month. And we start off kind of with an introduction, with the presentations. Um, and then very newcomers, um, we will have, we'll kind of introduce them to the organization. Usually I get that role. And uh, give them an idea of what NYC Mesh is, how it's not. A lot of people, we used to get a lot of people coming in and saying like, hey, how do I sign up or what do I do? And they were really more concerned about getting internet access rather than actually being part of the community. And so we spent a lot of time shifting. We really focus on shifting the uh, their perspective from the get-go of really this is a community project, get engaged, you can be, in, be involved in any way possible. Um, and so while we do that introduction, we quickly get them into working groups for skills that they might want to work on, such as web development, um, marketing and outreach, partnerships, um, and also network administration, of course, uh, software development. And so here are a few things. Uh, we have some icebreakers for new people, kind of get like, why are you interested in NYC Mesh? Uh, what this was a little icebreaker we did at one of our events, and we just asked people to post post-it notes on the uh, just the wall, like why do I care about net neutrality? Um, how can I make my community better? And then I also created a uh, volunteer sheet that's going to be on the website soon as well, and it's a way to really get people's availability, exactly what skills they're interested in. Uh, here I can show this, and I'm happy to share this as well if people are interested. Um, so it really breaks down all of the possible areas that we could use volunteers in and gives people an understanding that uh, there is a role for anyone in this organization and that it can be <laughs> done with as much or as little time as you have. So we do this, people fill this out, and then I immediately will contact them within the week, getting them straight onto 
our main channels of communication, which is Slack, which I'll get into a little later on how that's a really effective tool for at least our organization, um, and getting them scheduled into mostly installs. A lot of people are really interested in do doing installs and leading installs. Um, and that's actually our installer training program. So we encourage our uh, community to at least go on some installs. It might not be a regular thing, but just to really have a tangible understanding of the uh, process of building a mesh network. Oh, sorry. Um, and then, so we have a, oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so we have a we have a we established over the last year a system in order to get someone from an installer to an install leader, um, which would mean that they can actually go in the installs them they can organize everything and install a node in another person's apartment themselves. Um, it's roughly three. Uh, installs that we recommend they shadow for. They would hop onto our Slack channel and um, we post every all of our upcoming installs then. You can hop on, say, hey, I'm interested. And this is a way to get people really engaged in a hands-on way. A lot of people learn a lot of new skills. Most people don't have drilling experience or even much networking experience. Um, and it's a good way to get involved with the community. Um, we go in talk to the person who's getting the node installed, ask them why they want it. Um, we do take photos with them afterwards um, and usually post them to our social media as well, um, which really has helped uh, engage the community. And then another um, thing we do, because uh, not everyone, we still get a lot of hesitation from people about actually making that step into even those smaller installs to shadow. Um, so sometimes we've done a few large group installations, which has been pretty effective. Um, I mean, it got me as a member. So um, this was one we held last year, uh, or I, I attended actually. Um, you can see my backpack, and the <laughs> and uh, it was about 40 people. Uh, so this way, you can really passively just dip your toes into the water of the mesh network and um, not have to have any pressure of someone asking you a question that you couldn't understand or uh, you know have to climb up on a roof if that wasn't uh, uh, if you're not really good with like uh, hardware skills um, so this has been this was really effective and we've tried to do a few more it is a little harder to do this because you need a large roof um, there is some debates about whether or not uh, you know because people don't know what's going on if they're getting a little lost but I thought it was very effective because people when I went people just even if we couldn't hear everything even if we weren't like right into the install we were talking with other people we had that time to really like engage with other interested members and another project that we are trying to pilot a bit um, is a neighborhood chapter pilot and this is really um, a push for a more decentralized and more diverse um, a strive to have a more decentralized and more diverse organization is for neighborhoods themselves to really have a community, to map out their own installations, to in order to have a more effective mesh network, um, and also just expedite the process too. Um, right now, our main meetings are in central Manhattan, and so we get people from the outskirts of the city saying, hey, you know, I live in the Upper West Side, I would love to have a node. Um, can you do an install like tomorrow? And we say no because our network is not there. And trying to edu we it takes a little bit to educate them, but then with if we go to the neighborhood and they create if they lead their own neighborhood organization, um, we can get some momentum. We can get really interested volunteers, not just people who signed up for a join your crest join your request, which takes 30 seconds. So we can see, OK, if people are coming to these meetings, is this going to be worthwhile to really focus on that neighborhood? So we had one in um, Greenpoint, which is a neighborhood in North Brooklyn. 
Um, and that was really helpful because it really, that's an area that has had a lot of interest. Um, a lot of people in that neighborhood are very engaged in the community. Um, we have one person over at the end, Tiago, who has kind of become the neighborhood chapter leader and uh, is very receptive to that when I keep giving that title to him. And, <laughs> and uh, we've discussed, uh, we were able to map out, so there's these gray lines is kind of our idea of how we can actually strategize rather than having these one-off installs that would actually take away a lot of bandwidth from, and we can strategize when we put an Omnitech and make it a hub or um, what pattern that we do do to the installs. And with this, we've had group installs for the neighborhood. So we've had lar those larger installs, but then they can really get com engaged with their community, not just in evening meetings, but also on a Saturday doing an install themselves. And so I'm really excited for this because there are a lot of neighborhoods, as I mentioned at the beginning, who are underrepresented. And, uh, you know, our organization is a tech organization, and tech does have a lot of issues with uh, diversity, uh, both gender and uh, race. And so it would be, I think, a better way to have a grassroots approach to build the community from up rather than us coming as an organization into the neighborhood and just making a project for them that might not be sustained. Uh, and now just online engagement. Online engagement, similar to those large group installations, um, I'm a pretty big proponent in like awareness and giving people the opportunity to safely uh, lurk in a project. So um, we have a really active Slack channel. Slack has been where all of our information is, uh, pretty much all of our communication goes. Um, and anyone can use any, whatever app or communication system works for you, but this has been really successful for us. Um, we have 1,756 members and we talk about everything. We have a channel for our support. We have a channel for different dev projects, meetings, um, grants, funding. Um, so anything that you want to work on and you can hop in as a newcomer and see the conversations happening. It's not these private meetings. It's not set to the side. It's very transparent, very public. And um, a good way, I mean, definitely for people to get engaged and uh, just slowly become involved, more involved. Um, and so that has been really successful. And then also the volunteer sheets. We did have a little bit of an issue of like, for the first while, we would just be like, join Slack. And like getting a group to someone to adopt a new technology can sometimes uh, not be that successful. So we've been, with those volunteer sheets, we ask, are you on Slack? Are you not? And if they're not, directly just inviting them immediately. So it's like breaking down any barriers for people to really get involved. Um, and so that's been really, and actually I want to click on just to show how active, oh, no internet. Come on guys. <laughs> um, it's like, uh, probably 9am there and I'm sure there's like, uh, and this is also a good way for people who might have a busy schedule or might have disability issues or even just no longer live in New York City that like or you know live away for a certain reason and still want to get involved to be part of the community and uh, see what's and uh, participate in any way that they can. Um, accessibility is definitely one of the key things that we are working on. And actually I'll go back to those values soon. I don't know why I put them in that early. Um, all right, so yeah, so looking forward, we're looking to establish a pipeline of volunteers that reflects the diversity and ge geography of New York City, um, covering any invisible costs that would make volunteering accessible and participation to the mesh um, accessible to all. And I actually forgot to mention in the events, in addition to the monthly events, we've done a lot of specific nonprofit events as well, um, or workshops. Um, we recently had an install training workshop that people could come and learn how to do the install um, just on a Monday evening. Um, and that was 
really well attended. And I think we got a lot of new volunteers from that. And then we also had a grant writing workshop, which was open to anyone who was interested in grant writing for any kind of ac nonprofit or project that they were working on. It was a very neutral way um, because it's still really awesome to give people skills and um, power to do their own projects. Hopefully it becomes with NYC MESH. But um, so folk looking at skills and engagement with uh, partners in the community. Um, and then also, yeah, really continuing to define NYC MESH as an active community project and not a service to be passively consumed. And um, I, here are some photos. And let me just, uh, also, I want to go up to our principals just as like a final thing to show what uh, kind of what permeates throughout uh, a lot of the decisions we made. Why do I keep doing that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so we try to be accessible, uh, committed to connecting all people and eliminate, eliminating the cost and geography as barriers to internet access. Neutral, respect for net neutrality and privacy, no blocking content, no throttling data, and no collecting personal information. Fast, the highest liberal deliverable speeds for everyone to service tiers and no fast lanes. Resilient, designed to operate when disasters like Hurricane Sandy strike. Educational, everyone can become knowledgeable. And ours, a community nonprofit run by neighbors and volunteers. So now it's open to questions. I guess. Thanks. <laughs> Does anyone have it? Okay. First of all, great stuff. Uh, thank you for sharing this. I believe that the reason why you're growing so fast, it's partly because you have the geeks that do the network, but equally important are the people that make the community. Sure. Because the process, it's just equally important. And so, uh, one thing, uh, th there was a, a project uh, that was called Commotion Project. I don't know if, you, if you're aware of it. A commercial it, project? Commotion. 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 Uh, yeah, it was no. from the um, America. Yeah. OTI, the New America Foundation. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty familiar with New America. And so. they had uh, designed um, a whole process that was partly technological, but also social, mm -hmm. to bring in people and to explain them what the network is, how it works. Sure. And it was pretty nice because they were like giving you advices and schemes, like mm, some of, of the ones that I have seen that you are doing, mm -hmm. about how to explain what is a wireless router, how it works, uh, sure, and this yeah. kind of stuff. So you may want to look at it. I, in in Net Commons, there is Panos. With, that is uh, I think he's not, outside. Not here now. And he actually developed a, a, a methodology that was more about making local application for mesh networks, so involving people uh -huh. to enrich the network with local application. But there is a lot uh, that you can actually reuse in this process yeah. of explaining. Yeah, absolutely, and, yeah. and then the question is, <laughs> um, who is uh, liable for what the people do in the network? I mean, who is the owner of the IP addresses um, I think that's more for you, Zach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> so so you are liable for whatever. In the U.S., we don't have. In the U.S., we don't really have liability for actions. Um, you just get you're responsible to pass along the contact and/or the message that something has happened to the subscriber. So. What we do is I, I, we have a little bot, and when a message comes in to abuse at, I post it into the channel abuse. So it's been delivered to the community. So we delivered it. But we don't know who did it because we can't, we don't know. It's not possible to know. We okay. send gentle reminders to people to not abuse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If, I mean, I don't know nothing about the, the US system. In, in, in Europe, this is completely impossible. Like, uh, you have third party liability, which means that the, your customer 
shares something illegal and you receive uh, a notice by somebody and you if you are an ISP then you're not liable for that if you're not an ISP then you may be liable for that yeah, so, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying I think I'm sure there's something probably minorly similar to that in the US um, we're not an ISP but there is provisions in the Aaron system for what's called they actually classify a system as a community network so they have provisions for that the allocation of IPs we're using is from me and I'm registered as an ISP and so I am passing I, I SWIP or I reassign the addresses to this org so this is the end user but um, I think we fall under the community network group in any case as far as I've ever heard, we haven't really like had the FBI knocking at our door or anything. But as far as I, oops, sorry. Um, as far as I've heard, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, um, as far as we've heard, um, what what generally happens is they tell you deliver this message to them, and then uh, you try, or they say show me your data, and so they can look at our data. We have nothing. We don't have any logs. We have no records. You know. <laughs> Again, <laughs> uh, the, like w I'm talking, uh, I, of course, I'm, uh, I'm an IT guy, but we, uh, the legal people that were in the project, they were explaining this in a slightly different way. And basically, for third party liability and for civil actions, what the bad guys normally do is to look for somebody that has deep pockets. So it doesn't matter if it's the end user, if it's the ISP, if it's somebody in the chain, that the guy that has deep pockets regardless of how deep they are <laughs> so so in general the, 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 this this was a huge discussion in the project for the european context on how would be better for a community to organize legally because something else is that for instance in europe you have to we have quite strict privacy laws so somebody that tells you i want to participate and it gives you information personal information then you're responsible for holding them in a certain way securely and mm -hmm. by law and when some and we have data retention in 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 italy specifically yeah it's a sorry, little sorry, sorry, yeah. Maybe, uh, you're right <laughs> but sorry for that uh, but this was just if you didn't think about it i mean uh, this is one of the th key things that when you organize into something mm -hmm. you have to pay attention to I can bring it back to the to the talks okay. thing. Jillian was saying we want to create a nonprofit organization, which is, I guess, what you guys call association or federation. We don't have the same exact term. Um, doing this will allow us, as that entity, to be then an Aaron classified community network, which is technically under the ISP branch. So then we have most of those protections. We would then have to comply with what's required, which is showing the data when requested, but we can show them, and what we have is nothing. So we show them everything, and so we're good, right? So anyway, I think we might, but if we do, we'll collect all the data we can collect, which is nothing, so. <laughs> okay, next. Hi, thank you. Um, super interesting, and we've already talked a bit about it. I didn't, maybe I just didn't pay enough attention on the board structure slide. Sure. Are you yeah. having a joint board with ISOC? Or We're there's not. two boards, it was, but like, it, I was unclear if sure. what the degree of overlap is. It was and if, a, yeah, you could explain more. Yeah, just to explain that uh, slide is really just to show that we are not breaking our relationship with ISOC um, as far as just a, uh, but we are going to be two separate organizations. Um, I mean, we're evolving our relationship and redefining our relationship, but it's not burning bridges. This was definitely supported by ISOC. Um, they would love to see us as our own organization um, and have been incredibly great throughout the process. So, um, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned people coming to your uh, meetups and and uh, being slightly surprised by uh, the fact that you're not like a, just a service provider. Sure. And when you tell them that, what fraction of people 
get less interested and what fraction get more interested? Uh, I don't think people necessarily get less interested. I think, I mean, when we tell them, I mean, they are coming to an event, so I think that they do want some community involvement. Um, the harder part is how to change that interest from an idea to an action, and that's why we've had to take steps rather than just saying, hey, you do this yourself and join our Slack, or hey, and then you sign up for installs. It's really been a lot more about uh, getting their information, making a real connection with these people, um, and then giving them, seeing oppor finding opportunities for them to really get started that would uh, they would enjoy and stay connected. And we have had a lot of success with that. So... Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I guess one thing is that we do have a lot of people already in the pipeline who are not on it. So getting the word out is um, definitely a big thing, but also just continuing to keep those people engaged before while they're waiting to get on the network. I mean, we have, you know, 2,700 people who have signed up and are not on the network right now. Well, <laughs> I mean, we had a 130% increase last year, but um, yeah, it's we're not going to get that 2,700. And uh, people move, so that information is not always uh, the best. It really depends on where you live, and that's... Um, if you live in the East Village, if you live, or if you live in certain areas where we are, uh, we do have a strong presence. Then, and you have rooftop access and a line of sight, um, we can get you on immediately if you do the a few steps that we do need um, beyond just signing up. Um, and that's why, if you live in these other areas, um, that's where projects like new. Um, neighborhood chapters and also partnerships with other organizations will really come in handy um, to not just have people who passively signed up, but really build that community. And then uh, that with those neighborhood chapter meetings, um, the hope is that they can inform their own community, their own building. So um, outreach or like actually knowledge at this moment, um, we do work on it as far as like getting politicians to know more and doing outreach in that sense. On, and um, in the media, we do have a lot of journalists who come and write articles on us. Um, but it is one of those things that a lot of our media um, has kind of just been like, wow, this mesh network is a really cool idea. Like, But it's not, I think a lot of people don't quite believe it until they actually get involved and actually see the mesh network working. So uh, mostly it's been coming to the events and yeah. Um, hi. I can ask another question. Um, maybe how are you all thinking about sustainability of the organization? And sure. you could answer maybe just a piece of that because that's a big one. Yeah. Um, and maybe some of it is like social, but also financial. Absolutely. And maybe some technical aspects, but whatever part of yeah. it you want to. Yeah. Um, definitely. Uh, really engaging volunteers on different levels. Um, we definitely need people who can provide support. A lot of people get really excited on helping with installs and they don't want to help with stuff afterwards. So, um, and that's another idea with the neighborhood chapters is for them to really have an understanding of their, to have it really much more decentralized and that the neighborhood chapters can fund themselves, work on their own problems. We try to to, we want to give as much support as possible so that they can run well um, and that they can fix minor problems themselves within their own community. They can lead installs, plan out installs. I mean, this is uh, a plan for, you know, the next few years, but, um, and really it's, we're seeing how the success goes on a small scale right now, but that would be the goal is that um, these neighborhoods and, um, other organizations who want to pilot or want to be part of the mesh can kind of do that support. Um, and also work, uh, like events, like workshops, like the grant writing workshop is a way, uh, to 
teach people how to write grants for our organization um, to help fund us to cover things such as hidden costs and also work on new projects. Um, and yeah, teaching people other skills other than just the most obvious ones such as installations, so. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, you were talking a bit about the governance structure and the board, and I was wondering sure. um, how you do decision making or how you will be doing decision making and sure. kind of what kind of issues have arisen. We're mostly going to keep it at uh, financial decision making. We really don't want this uh, board to have too much power, um, but it we do want to have especially a bit more transparency and um, group uh, consensus for large financial decisions. Um, we really just submitted our information to the state of New York for the nonprofit, so we are still uh, kind of working on how often we're going to meet and how the decisions are going to be made. But um, definitely two areas that uh, are critical for us to really define are voting processes and membership. There has been a lot of disagreements amongst the community. We've uh, made a lot of platforms for input. Uh, so uh, looking at different models for that uh, is something that we need to uh, work on. So. So you have something like 300 nodes and 3,000 people on the waiting list. Yes. When when somebody shows up to your meeting and sees those numbers, um, do any of them decide they want to be in, um, involved anyway and set up um, a node and share the bandwidth that they already have and yeah. sort of be the leader in their block? Sure. Um, we have a guy in the Bronx. What's his name? Bob. Bob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Bob does that. <laughs> uh, the Bronx is not um, part of, or not, uh, obviously it's this much further north up here, uh, and it's not part of the majority of our mesh network, um, but he is, he has a business line which costs roughly $100 a month, set up an Omnitech and shares it with his community and his building, and that's, to bring it back to the neighborhood organizations, definitely uh, those kind of ideas is something that can be uh, communicated to them. Yeah, if you want to start it, you, if you want to have a mesh network in your neighborhood and we are not there yet, um, you can expedite it by that and then hopefully we can eventually get uh, our network towards those business lines. So. Um, the hardware, the actual nodes, do people buy their own hardware or sure, yeah. it's all sponsored through um, your funding? So we ask for between a $120 and a $240 donation um, for, the dona for the hardware um, when they go in and install. And once, they d once we have installed it, they would own the antenna, they would own all the equipment, the router. Um, and that 240 actually also includes a $50 installation fee. Um, all this is donation-based, so if someone cannot afford it, um, we don't ask them why they can't afford it. We don't ask for any documentation, um, but um, we can find ways to subsidize it. So, that's it. Uh, so you have some meeting points where uh, people we have more a background in social and in technology. So in my personal experience, um, because this kind of project, the technical people becomes more excited than the social people, and the social people becomes, um, uh, how to say, discriminated because they don't know what's going on. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Like. But uh, this is. So the question is, okay. <laughs> yeah, because I know that 
Uh, and I hate that. And I, uh, yeah. wa I want to put bridge on that because, for example, we were talking that you don't, you don't know uh, how it goes, the network thing, <laughs> but you are very valuable for your community. And we need more people like you in our community networks. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, uh, if, if you can explain group dynamics or um, how to bridge this yeah. two roles in the community. Uh. Sure, yeah. Um, so I think we kind of explained yesterday, I was speaking with Pablo just about my experience. And uh, I am one of the few women in the organization, especially one of the few actively involved women. Um, and that, in addition to people who don't have a very technical background, um, definitely can feel discouraged. I think my experience or how I really got involved was my own push to be in the organization. Um, but being part of the group, uh, the community, I do recognize that not everyone is going to have um, that drive or just be able to kind of uh, put themselves in situations that they can find and that um, that they could find uh, their niche. Um, so we try to do a lot of education and uh, in way and give people opportunities, really make it clear to people how they can get involved and uh, how their skills can be of use to an organization, um, even if they're not tech. But in order to teach, we also do want to teach people tech. Um, we Zach does networking one on one classes that teaches the basics of networking. Uh, we do, I mean, install training and we try to make it as accessible as possible because really like an installation isn't, once you're there, m most people can p install a node. It's really just like doing any other kind of a household uh, chore or something like that. Just a little bit of drilling, but it's not... Um, it's pretty accessible to most people, but um, make, and that's what I'm saying is that like, we make our events in a way that uh, even novices can learn. Um, we do put all of our documentation on our website as well, um, and our, our uh, PowerPoints. So trying to make it accessible, but yes, um, definitely the, those who already have a tech background are, probably going to stick with it a little sooner. Um, but the push has been to show that there are many things that need to uh, be done in order to have a well-functioning organization. So that answers. Anything else? Okay. Uh, I, um, in, uh, in Rome, in Italy, uh -huh. we we have a recurrent discussion that is whether we should have uh, our own organization. Uh, right now we have uh, an umbrella organization who owns the autonomous system number, the IP addresses and stuff. Okay, yeah. But it's with a different name, they're not really involved. So it kind of sounds like what we had yeah, with exactly. ISOC, yeah. Yeah, but uh, when uh, this uh, discussion about having our own organization pops up, uh, usually the group splits into halves. <laughs> One <laughs> is this happening already? Uh, is this happening? Yeah, I mean it definitely happened, uh, and it it does happen. And uh, but pers for us as an organization, it's a way to have a more formal way of reaching a consensus. Eventually, you have to reach a consensus. And beforehand, it was either because nobody knew what their role was or uh, knew how many people needed to agree on something, um, initiatives either wouldn't be taken because people would be like, oh yeah, I mean, I want this, but like, oh wait, or whatever. And then, uh, or, and then eventually one rogue person might do something that wasn't agreed upon by everyone else. So uh, I, I think some, org there, there definitely have been disagreements about uh, becoming an org. Uh, again, we had a quite a contentious 
uh, <laughs> like this channel. I created an org development channel for the discussion. And as you can see by the longer the <laughs> comments, uh, <laughs> the, so uh, it's definitely, and also the we got a lot of people who were, uh, had their own opinions about things that uh, weren't very involved in the first place. We were like, okay, cool. Um, so I think at the end of the day, uh, consensus will come by, uh, eventually. So, but <laughs> it was quite an arduous process. All right. Anything else? I have a question precisely ah. about this. Sure. So you, it's, um, it's a p paper sheet you hand out, yep. isn't it? Yep, and I'm okay. going to put it on the website soon, too. I was supposed to do that two weeks ago, and I didn't. <laughs> and then, you, so people check their boxes. Yeah. And what you do afterwards? Do okay. you invite them, or do you record the da data somewhere? I do because, record, yeah. Okay. Bec oh, so, uh, yeah, so afterwards we fill it out. Um, and kind of get as much information as possible about what they're interested in and how they're going to do this. Um, and and give an idea of what our organization actually is. Um, afterwards, I do log it on a spreadsheet, a uh, fairly low tech. I date it. Um, and then within the week, reach out to them. I was, and with the reach out, it's been inviting people to Slack immediately. And with a message like, hey, you're now part of Slack. You don't have to do this yourself. Um, here are the channels that are going to most interest you. And then afterwards, I also would send an email based on one of those four categories that they checked off and give exact projects and exact information on how to do it. So it's really giving them as much information as possible from the beginning. They have no reason uh, not to get engaged to some extent. So um, and it's a good way to really know, like, who's coming to our meetings, how many people, like, I mean, how many people are interested in actually volunteering and signing up and not just passively attending meetings, which is fine if they want to do that, but um, to really capture them from the beginning. And so. so, for instance, every person that comes in a meeting will get one of those and they can fill it out or yeah, not? Yeah, not everyone will <laughs> fill it out. Yeah, um, of course. Definitely gathering data more on the meetings is something that uh, I would like to do. Uh, but yeah, uh, those who are interested uh, do fill these out. So, yeah. All right, is that okay, it? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you.